Section 11 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 1. Ancient Chaldea, Part 11. The last independent king of Babylon, Nabonaed, Nabonidos, at length discovered the cylinders in which Naramsin, son of Sargon, had signified to posterity all that he had done towards the erection of a temple worthy of the deity to the god of Sippara. For three thousand two hundred years, not one of the kings had been able to find them. We have no means of judging what these edifices were like for which the Chaldeans themselves showed such veneration. They have entirely disappeared, or if anything remains of them, the excavations hitherto carried out have not revealed it. Many small objects, however, which have accidentally escaped destruction, give us a fair idea of the artists who lived in Babylon at this time, and of their skill in handling the graving tool and chisel. An alabaster vase with the name of Naramsin, and a mace head of exquisitely veined marble, dedicated by Shargani Shar Ali to the sun-god of Sippara, are valued only on account of the beauty of the material and the rarity of the inscription. But a porphyry cylinder, which belonged to Ibnishar, scribe of the above-named Shargani, must be ranked among the masterpieces of oriental engraving. It represents the hero Gilgamesh, kneeling and holding with both hands a spherically shaped vase, from which flow two copious jets, forming a stream running through the country. An ox, armed with a pair of gigantic crescent-shaped horns, throws back its head to catch one of the jets as it falls. Everything in this little specimen is equally worthy of admiration. The purity of outline, the skilful and delicate cutting of the intaglio, the fidelity of the action, and the accuracy of form. A fragment of a bas-relief of the reign of Naramsin shows that the sculptors were not a bit behind the engravers of gems. This consists now only of a single figure, a god, who is standing on the right, wearing a conical head-dress and clothed in a hairy garment, which leaves his right arm free. The legs are wanting, the left arm and hair are for the most part broken away, while the features have also suffered. Its distinguishing characteristic is a subtlety of workmanship which is lacking in the artistic products of a later age. The outline stands out from the background with a rare delicacy, the details of the muscles being in no sense exaggerated. Were it not for the costume and pointed beard, one would fancy it a specimen of Egyptian work of the best Memphite period. Did Sargon and Naramsin live at so early a date, as that assigned to them by Nabonidos? The scribes who assisted the kings of the Second Babylonian Empire in their archaeological researches had perhaps insufficient reasons for placing the date of these kings so far back in the misty past. Should evidence of a serious character constrain us to attribute them to a later origin, we ought not to be surprised. In the meantime, our best course is to accept the opinion of the Chaldeans, and to leave Sargon and Naramsin in the century assigned them by Nabonidos, although from this point they look down as from a high eminence upon all the rest of Chaldean antiquity. Excavations have brought to light several personages of a similar date, whether a little earlier or a little later. Bengali Sharli, Man Ishturba, and especially Alu Sharshid, who lived at Kishu and Nippur, and gained victories over Elam. After this glimpse of light on these shadowy kings, darkness once more closes in upon us, and conceals from us the majority of the sovereigns who ruled afterwards in Babylon. The facts and names which can be referred with certainty to the following centuries belong not to Babylon, but to the southern states, Lagash, Uruk, Uru, Nishin, and Larsam. The national writers had neglected these principalities. We possess neither a resume of their chronicles nor a list of their dynasties, and the inscriptions which speak of their city gods and princes are still very rare. Lagash, as far as our evidence goes, was perhaps the most illustrious of all these cities. It occupied the heart of the country, and its site covered both sides of the Shat al Hai. The Tigris separated it on the east from Anshan, the westernmost of the Elamite districts, with which it carried on a perpetual frontier war. All parts of the country were not equally fertile. The fruitful and well-cultivated district in the neighborhood of the Shat el Hai gave place to impoverished lands, ending to the eastward finally in swampy marshes, which with great difficulty furnished means of sustenance to a poor and thinly scattered population of fisherfolk. The capital, built on the left bank of the river, 
stretched out to the northeast and southwest a distance of some five miles. It was not so much a city as an agglomeration of large villages, each grouped around a temple or palace. Uruazaga, Gishgila, Gersu, Nina, and Lagash, which latter imposed its name upon the whole. A branch of the river shot El Hai protected it on the south, and supplied the village of Nina with water. No trace of an enclosing wall has been found, and the temples and palaces seem to have served as refuges in case of attack. It had as its arms, or totem, a double-headed eagle standing on a lion passant, or on two demi-lions placed back to back. Its chief god was called Ningirsu, that is, the lord of Girsu, where his temple stood. His companion Bao, and his associates Ninagal, Inanna, and Ninsia, were the deities of the other divisions of the city. The princes were first called kings, but afterwards vice-regents, Patisi, when they came under the suzerainty of a more powerful king, the king of Uruk, or of Babylon. The earlier history of this remarkable town is made up of the scanty memoirs of its rulers, together with those of the princes of Gishban, the land of the bow, of which Inshin seems to have been the principal town. A very ancient document states that at the instigant of Inlil, the god of Nippur, the local deities, Ningirsu and Kirsig, set up a boundary between the two cities. In the course of time, Meshalim, a king of Kishu, which before the rise of Agade was the chief town in those parts, extended his dominion over Lagash, and erected his stele at its border. Ush, vice-regent of Gishban, however, removed it, and had to suffer defeat before he would recognize the new order of things. After the lapse of some years, of which we possess no records, we find the mention of a certain Urukagina, who assumes the title of king. He restored or enlarged several temples, and dug the canal which supplied the town of Nina with water. A few generations later we find the ruling authority in the hands of a certain Urnina, whose father, Ninigaldan, and grandfather, Gershur, received no titles, a fact which proves that they could not have been reigning sovereigns. Urnina appears to have been of a peaceful and devout disposition, as the inscriptions contain frequent references to the edifices he had erected in honor of the gods, the sacred objects he had dedicated to them, and the timber for building purposes which he had brought from Magan, but there is no mention in them of any war. His son Ukrugal was also a builder of temples, but his grandson Idin Guranagin, who succeeded Ukrugal, was a warlike and combative prince. It seems probable that, about that time, the kingdom of Gishban had become a really powerful state. It had triumphed not only over Babylonia proper, but over Kish, Uru, Uruk, and Larsam, while one of its sovereigns had actually established his rule in some parts of northern Syria. Edin Garanagin vanquished the troops of Gishban, and there is now in the Louvre a trophy which he dedicated in the temple of Ningirsu on his return from the campaign. The design and execution of these scenes are singularly rude. Men and beasts, indeed all the figures, have exaggerated proportions, uncouth forms, awkward positions, and an uncertain and heavy gait. The war ended in a treaty concluded with Enakali, vice-regent of Grishban, by which Lagash obtained considerable advantages. Idin Garanagin placed the stele of Mishilim, overthrown by one of Enagali's predecessors, and dug a ditch from the Euphrates to the provinces of Gildan to serve henceforth as a boundary. He further levied a tribute of corn for the benefit of the goddess Nina, and her consort Ningirsu, and applied the spoils of the campaign to the building of new sanctuaries for the patron gods of his city. His reign was, on the whole, a glorious and successful one. He conquered the mountain district of Elam, rescued Uruk and Uru, which had both fallen into the hands of the people of Gishban, organized an expedition against the town of Oz, and killed its vice-regent, in addition to which he burnt Arsua, and devastated the district of Mishimi. He next directed an attack against Zuran, king of Edban, and by vanquishing this prince on the field of battle, he extended his dominion over nearly the whole of Babylonia. The prosperity of his dynasty was subjected to numerous and strange vicissitudes. Whether it was that its resources were too feeble to stand the exigencies and strain of war for any length of time, or that intestine strife had been the chief cause of its decline, we cannot say. Its kings married many wives and became surrounded with a numerous progeny. Urnina had at least four sons. They often entrusted to their children or their sons-in-law the government of the small towns, which together made up the city. These represented so many temporary fiefs, 
of which the holders were distinguished by the title of vice-regents. This dismemberment of the supreme authority in the interest of princes, who believed for the most part that they had stronger claims to the throne than its occupant, was attended with dangers to peace and to the permanence of the dynasty. The texts furnish us with evidence of the existence of at least half a dozen descendants of Urkogal, Enanatuma I, Entamena, his grandson, Enanatuma II, all of which seem to have been vigorous rulers who energetically maintained the supremacy over their city over the neighboring estates. Enanatuma I, however, proved no match in the end against Urlama, the vice-regent of Gishban, and lost part at least of the territory acquired by Idin Garanadin. But his son Entamena defeated Urlama on the banks of the Lama Sirta Canal, and having killed or deposed him, gave the vice-regency of Gishban to a certain he, priest of Ninab, who remained his loyal vassal to the end of his days. With his aid, Intamina restored the stele and walls which had been destroyed during the war. He also cleared out the old canals and dug new ones, the most important of which was apparently an arm of the Shat el Hai, and ran from the Euphrates to the Tigris, through the very centre of the domains of Girsu. End of Part 11 Read by Professor Heather and By For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org